Welcome to Wide Mindedness with Victoria Ball, the podcast in which I interview expert guests who want to join me in celebrating that life is not black and white. Our society is increasingly divided, and the us versus them mentality seems to dominate our conversations and relationships with others. I believe that life is much richer when we widen our minds to consider multiple opinions and perspectives. So challenge your assumptions and let's become truly wide-minded together. In today's episode, I am joined by a man the BBC has called an advertising legend. Robin White started out as a copywriter alongside the likes of Charles Saatchi and Sir Alan Parker at Collett Dickinson Pierce. In 1979, Robin co-founded WCRS, the first of the new generation of ad agencies. Robin was behind some of the most iconic brand campaigns of the 20th century, from 118118's Got Your Number to The Future's Bright, The Future's Orange. Nineteen years ago, Robin founded the Ideas Foundation to create a pathway into the creative industries for talented young people from diverse backgrounds. Since moving to the beautiful southwest countryside with his wife, Robin has founded Exmoor Branding to help local brands on a low or no-cost basis. He also runs the Robin White Ideas Clinic to give two-day ideas boosts to brands, large and small. Most recently, Robin was appointed as an honorary colonel in the British Army's 77th Brigade. He is currently writing his autobiography, The Most Fun You Can Have With Your Clothes On. Hello, Robin. Hello. Welcome to Glorious Exmoor. So I know that uh, wide-mindedness is something that is close to your heart, and I'm thrilled that you're talking to us about it today. I recently read that six in ten people consider that the society they live in is more divided now than... 10 years before. You have enjoyed a very long and illustrious career. Do you see this? Do you think we are becoming more divided? Uh, I think we are. You can see it at the national level in politics in America, and indeed here with the the split over Remain uh, and Leave. I think you can see a mechanic for it in social media, because broadly speaking, uh, social media means you follow the people you like. You don't follow the people you don't like or you seldom do that, unless you're a troll. And that comes about, and there's a well-known mechanism called cognitive dissonance, which is whereby we have a a balancing of our mind of all the beliefs that we share um, and that we hold. And then if we don't like something, we reprocess that input into our brain. So social media is a sort of a cognitive dissonance tool. So we only look at what we want to look at. And the more we only look at what we like looking about, the narrower our minds become. Mm, That's so interesting. You've obviously spent um, a lifetime in the world of media, which is, of course, changing all the time. And with social media has changed that so much. Identity is central to advertising. Do you think it is necessary to have an other against which to construct our own identity, or is there another way? I don't think you have to do that, but you can see why the brain would do that, because the more you have an other, the more you reinforce yourself. Um, And I think, again, our brains, if you look at brain science, our brains are wired up to have more of the same. If you watch in a brain scanner, someone uh, practicing something they've done before, and then you look in the same brain scanner at somebody taking on a new task, you see it takes twice as much brain energy to uh, do the new task than the practice task. So wide-mindedness requires twice as much brain energy as closed-mindedness, which Mm -hmm. is a drawback. Uh, because of all the advantages of wide-mindedness. But the reason why the brain does that is the brain saves its energy for passing on its genes. Sex has to come into this somewhere. Um, Mm. And passing on the genes uh, means who do I want to have lunch with, who do I want to fall in love with. It doesn't mean um, uh, what brand of toothpaste or mobile phone or car to, to stick at the world of branding for a second. So our brains are wired up to have more of the same. Our brains are wired up to be narrow to save brain energy, 
or to save energy. You know, our brains use 20% of the total energy consumption of our body, uh, that tiny little jelly mass uh, above our neck. So all of that means that we're wired up to have narrow minds, not broad minds. And therefore, those who do have broad minds and manage to have it, have, in my view, a competitive advantage of those who have narrow minds. That is, of course, the thing I am passionate about. And I can't think of anyone who is more wide-minded than you. You've recently founded the Robin White Ideas Clinic. You have had so many brilliant and creative ideas over your career. How wide-minded do you think you have to be to keep that inspiration, to keep coming up with innovative ideas? Well, I think the, the word that I would have used before I came across your excellent word, wide-mindedness, which I do like and hope you've got it registered, is the word curious. I think uh, curiosity is the driving force, certainly of myself, and anybody who's lucky enough to have a wider mind. Uh, curious people, uh, I mean, advertising is the place for the, or one of the places for the curious mind, because every day uh, you are with a new brief, a new brand, um, and you can, you, you, have to have a natural enthusiasm for finding out something new. I One of the things I did in advertising was to invent this concept of what I call product interrogation, of interrogating a product till it confesses it to its strengths. And that is, uh, if you like, being a journalist, but looking for good news, not bad news. So um, with BMW, for example, for 35 years of doing their advertising, I'd go around and, in and interview their engineers and find out the stories, you know, I remember looking down once on the, there was a pile of bits of uh, metal con rods on the, on the floor. And I said, well, you know, what, what's wrong with those con rods, which was like the curiosity factor. And they said, oh, we, you know, we, we rejected them. Uh, I said, it, they, they, they gave me that they were a certain number of grams out of weight to the stand. And I discovered that um, that weight was the weight of a butterfly. So then I did an ad, we did an ad which had a butterfly on uh, one conrod and the butterfly not on the other one. And it said, now it's too heavy, now it's not. So that is an, a narrative that comes about by asking a simple question, you know, why, the, the why question, why is that conrod being rejected? And all the way through my advertising life, uh, it has been asking those questions, not sitting in a bath and having an idea, but 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 coming across a fact, I mean, other people come up with advertising ideas in a different way. But my own approach was curiosity, always asking questions because I'm a writer by trade, um, and therefore that curiosity gave me has given me a sort of wide mindedness, and that's why uh, I've done. I could have just been a politician or I could have been an ad man, but I've done such a broad, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, perhaps, but it's a much more engaging and amusing thing to be. When I explain wide-mindedness to people, I break it down into four steps. And I say the first is to be curious about the world around you. The second is to communicate with others who think differently. The third is to challenge your own assumptions. And then the fourth is to change and put that into a mm practice going forward. And I absolutely agree with you that curiosity is central to that. You've got to be interested in the world around. The, the other the other word which comes out, of, which ends in TY, is diversity. Um, and mm. that's another way into the same subject. And if you look at uh, a, a nation, I think the most successful nations are the most diverse nations. We already know from McKinsey that the most successful companies are the most diverse either in terms of gender or in terms of ethnicity and again if you if you look at um, the facts and you you can see that America is probably the most diverse nation in the world everybody who ever is in is in America was in origin uh, at some stage from another culture another gene pool another cult uh, another cultural pattern and that diversity has made America the most successful nation in the world. Diversity uh, will make will make Britain more successful. Why is Britain uh, traditionally, uh, so in terms of Nobel prizes, more creative in science than, say, France or indeed Germany, who are 
more successful at manufacturing than ourselves, but not more successful in creativity. I used to say when I was doing the ads when I was for BMW, that the most perfect combination, or the worst combination, was um, British engineering uh, and German marketing. And the worst combination, and the best combination was German manufacturing and British marketing. Uh, so it's, it, I wouldn't say it's, it solves everything, but it certainly gives you a, a jumping off ball because without the curiosity, without the wine binders, you don't have the original ideas, which you can then replicate through the tedious process of manufacturing. That's a great point that you raise. And I actually think that wide mindedness could be seen as the sort of active application of diversity. It is engaging with the very thing that makes them different. I know that diversity is key to the Ideas Foundation. Well, I I would say diversity hasn't changed much in the workplace. Um, That ethnic minorities, certainly in the the communication industries, are still in a tiny minority. So the Ideas Foundation was set up with the mission of saying, look, creativity is not involved we do we is not involved in terms of diversity in terms of the advertising industry how much talent is going to waste um how much talent and, and it's a longer story we have to maybe have a separate separate podcast about the ideas foundation and diversity but in essence mm. i don't think and, and we've got a model now we get brands to sponsor briefs we've got young people who were from backgrounds uh, you know, in very bad schools, ethnic minorities, now as a marketing manager in Apple, now as a an agency called Droga 5 as an art director, but it's a handful. We haven't won that battle. And I don't think, I, I, as I talked to you, I think we haven't really persuaded people that if you want to make your company more successful, make it more diverse. Um, and that is in the era of coronavirus, maybe a, a lesson there. How can we kickstart our businesses and maybe make them more diverse? would be one way of doing that. Have you got any tips either on a business level or a personal level for how we can all become more wide-minded during this very unusual situation that we're finding ourselves in at the moment? Well, I have my general multi-purpose maxim is that every problem is an opportunity in disguise. And now we've got, mm. if we've got the biggest problem we've ever had, we must have by that logic, the biggest opportunity. Um, and we're now struggling and looking around ways to find that opportunity. I certainly think that there's one which uh, I'm writing about at the moment, which I call moving over to half and half working, because we're all working uh, from home uh, on, with Zoom conferences, etc. And I think, you know, we there's been many conversations over recent years about you know, teleworking, as it used to be called. I think that what we're finding is that, that we can do much more working from home. Um, and half and half working would be that half the company works, goes back, and how do we do that with minimum health risks? Half the company goes back and works, but with social distancing inside the office, which doesn't exist at the moment. We're all like battery hens on our lap, on our computers and our laptops. Half the, so half the office is there working uh, with social distancing, and then the other half comes, swaps around, um, and that continues, and therefore you get the meetings and the face co- contacts and, and all those things, but you also get more time at home working, more thoughtful working, uh, and more family time as well a- alongside that. So I think that that's an example of, of the half-and-half half model could be something good coming out of coronavirus. Yeah, it's it's uh, certainly going to redefine, I think, the way that we are in a lot of walks of life. Now, I know you're quite involved with politics or interested in politics, how do you think we can get away from these sort of mudslinging divisions that that has dominated a lot of modern politics and encourage healthy challenge and debate? And it's interesting because we because we have seen a change in how politics is conducted in this period of coronavirus. And what can we learn to make it more wide minded going forward? Well, I think I think you're right. You know, you can see. It, it, uh, the way which the, the communities have come together um, in one way or another, people you know, helping people, maybe talking to their neighbours for the first time. Uh, it, it, so they, another of these maxims is that the way to get rid of a problem is to get a bigger problem. Um, and we've got a bigger problem. So uh, what I think the, the, the danger of the the, the danger to look out for is that when it is all through, we'll be do, we'll be post marketing and blaming people, and I think that probably uh, it would be good to get a narrative going 
which said this has been a huge uh, laboratory experiment for humanity and it's not possible for everybody to get everything right. And I think we should start, it's very hard for politicians to talk about not getting things right, especially as people are dying because of it. So maybe that's an unreasonable ambition. But I think that the general lesson coming out of it is that you know, we, we, we can work together rather than fight. I certainly see some people who really hated Boris Johnson uh, now uh, dislike him less and can see the role for a national leader. And they're probably conservatives like me who can see in some of the, let's call it compassionate socialism, uh, something which we can learn from as well. This is why I've decided to start talking about wide-mindedness at this time. It's something that, you know, I've been passionate about for a long time. But I think a lot more people are becoming aware that actually the world was becoming very black and white. Can you tell us a little bit more about your involvement with the military and just talk a bit about their approach to out-of-the-box thinking? Well, yeah. The 77 Brigade was set up by the army a couple of years ago, and it's called 77 because it's modelled on uh, a British general uh, called Ord Wingate, who was like a, an SAS-style general uh, in Burma fighting against the Japanese, sadly killed in a crash in 1944. And he did very alternative original military thinking, putting uh, troops behind the line to attack the Japanese, etc. So that's why it's called 77 Brigade. And the British Army realized that they're good at fighting, uh, but not good at information warfare, where the Russians, uh, the, the Taliban, uh, ISIS were much better. And therefore, the army realized it needed to get skills from outside military territory. So the comms industry, where I've worked for uh, over 40 years, was one of the areas. And that's, I was sort of randomly approached. Um, and my contribution is to develop a non that and most of it is cyber warfare information warfare that sort of area uh, is doing quite a lot at the moment fighting against uh, fake news which has been pumped into the whole coronavirus situation and giving advice to the cabinet office i'm not involved in in that area uh, my area where i'm involved has been in using in estonia where there's a british uh, brigade uh, as part of the, the NATO uh, set up there. And what I've been involved in is uh, using the, the concept of using culture as a weapon, but a weapon for presenting, preventing war rather than creating war and building, uh, using music in, in, in Estonia because uh, it's, it's a nation of singing and to get British soldiers singing in Estonian uh, as a choir to welcome an Estonian choir when they were travelling around the countryside as part of a national celebration. And the, the custodians couldn't believe that British soldiers were singing in Estonian. It's a very simple idea. It got simple idea, got a lot of coverage on Estonian uh, television. And it is, it, it is, the concept is in a phrase, it's called information, not information warfare, but information peace fair. And that's something I'm trying to develop, which the army has accepted and is perhaps a good example of wide-mindedness. Yes, I would agree completely. It's a reframing of what we thought we knew. Uh, and I love that phrase, peace fair. How brilliant is that? And as you know, I'm passionate about languages. I couldn't agree more that when you speak to somebody or sing to somebody even better in their own language, it forms a connection to the heart rather than just the head. And I think that's really what I'm passionate about, connecting with people on a human level. Opinions are inherently formed by people's backgrounds and their experiences. Mm. And that's that's really important. Well, it may be. I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the world of system one and system two thinking. As you talk, it makes me think that the system one mind, which is our ancient ancestral mind, which is our instinctive mind, actually is much more wide minded than our system uh, two mind, which is our logical, intelligent neocortex, um, our logical mind. And in a way, another way of saying how do we generate more wide-mindedness is to say let's be more in contact with our system one mind as much as we can and let's let the system two mind dominate our behavior well my fear is that unless we all become a little more wide-minded we will become afraid of standing out and being different and going against the flow now anyone who knows you and i hope 
many people uh, click onto your website after this and see photos of you, then they will just realise that your fabulous dress sense and style quite clearly marks you out as somebody who fosters creativity and individuality. Is that important to you, that we don't become clones who all think the same? The thing about clothing is that everybody, every item of clothing everybody's wearing is chosen by them at some point in time to wear. And I've always found, um, first of all, instinctively, and then understanding the concept in brain science, that wearing, let's call it peacock's tail clothing, signalling my genetic fitness, got me attention. And I found attention quite a good thing to have. Uh, uh, it, you know, it, it, and that's why I got my fourth and final wife. Um, but it, it, exhibitionism, attention, all those things, it's, a, it's, it's been a marketing tool for me in the, the creative industries. So I've noticed and not ignored. So all of these things can give you a competitive advantage. So, you know, that's what I did instinctively. Now what I do deliberately with my purple brand. Which I love, Robin, and I'm sure lots of other people will come to adore as well when they discover it. Um, so finally, thank you so much for talking to me. But before I close, I just would like to ask you, if you had to sort of reflect on this topic of wide-mindedness, how would you sum up the major benefits of being more wide-minded? Well, I, as an ad man, I'd have to give you a slogan, widen your mind, improve your life. Robin White, I love it. Thank you so much for joining me today. You've been a pleasure to have. I agree with you. Let's keep being wide-minded. Thank you. Bye for now. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Wide Mindedness with Victoria Ball. Help others learn about it by rating, reviewing and subscribing. For more great wide-minded content, follow at Wide Mindedness Victoria Ball on Instagram, at Wide Mindedness on Twitter and sign up to the monthly newsletter at victoria-ball.com.